More than 4,000 years ago, the dawn of civilization began to shine over the land of China. The first country came into being among the primitive tribes of the Yellow River Valley. Over 500 years later, Xia was replaced by Shang State in the 11th century BC. The Zhou State conquered the country by force. As only one of the princes could succeed to the throne, the rest were given to feuding. Generation after generation, dozens of states within a state emerged. Wars broke out and continued on and off for over 500 years. It was not until 230 BC that an army from the northwest began to sweep away all these warring states. It annexed all the states and conquered all the tribes within a period of just 10 years. It was this army that finally put an end to the wars. A unified state, the Qin Empire, was founded for the first time in China. This was an army which created history. Nevertheless, people have had little understanding of it. Its image has been blurred and indistinct. What was the source of this strong Qin army? How did it accomplish this gigantic task? Looking back upon the pace of the unification of the Qin army, we find it had a long and tortuous history. More than 3,000 years ago, the Zhou state ruled over China from its capital, Hao. On its northwest border lived a tribe who raised horses exclusively for the monarch. These were the earliest Qin. Where this legendary tribe originally came from, and when it moved to the northwest highlands, is still a mystery. In 771 BC, a nomadic tribe from the west captured the capital, Hao, and the Zhou state was forced to move its capital. As the king of Zhou traveled eastward, the Qin's horse raisers escorted him with warriors. In order to express his gratitude for the Qin's loyalty, the Zhou king conferred on the leader of the Qin's the rank of feudal prince. In this way, the Qin's set up their own state. But shortly after the founding of their state, the Qin's faced an extremely difficult situation. At that time, the Northwest Highlands were under the rule of a nomadic tribe. This tribe rode on horseback and were extremely violent. They regularly attacked and killed the Qin's. According to the historical records, several generations of the former kings of Qin were all killed on the battlefield. Thus the Qin and their army shed their blood like water at the very beginning of the founding of the state. Nevertheless, this staunch army matured and hardened in adverse circumstances. After more than 200 years of bloody battles, the Qin army completely conquered this wild but brave nomadic people and thus unified the Northwest Highlands. Having got a firm foothold in the West, the Qin's turned their attention to the East. At that time, the King of Zhou had lost his dominant position. The flames of war were raging on the Central Plains. These were times of no quarter asked or given, the survival of the fittest. After hundreds of years of wars of annexation, the weaker states were eliminated one after another. Finally, the Qin's faced just six strong opponents. The Qin's found these opponents to be far stronger than the nomadic tribes of the grasslands. They realized their dream of eastward expansion could not be realized in a short period of time. Oh. 
The turning point came in 356 BC. In that year, a person called Shang Yang began to carry out reformations of the Qin Empire. After these political reforms, the Qin army marched eastwards. The Wei state was the first overlord in the Warring States period. According to the historical records, the Wei army was noted for its full armor and its valor. Nevertheless, the valiant Wei army turned out to be the first victim of the Qin. In 293 BC, the Qin army killed 240,000 Wei soldiers, after which the Wei state went into decline. The Chu state was a powerful state in the south. The bronze swords made by the Chu had had a great reputation up till this time. In 278 BC, the Qin army occupied Ying, which had been the capital of the Chu for several hundred years. Chu would never rise again. The Zhao state was in the north. Its people were famous for their bravery and their fighting skills, and they had long harassed the nomadic nationalities in the region. But in 260 BC, the Qin army annihilated 450,000 picked men of the Zhao army at Changping. The Zhao state was greatly undermined. Since the political reforms of Shangyang, the strong Qin army had sapped the military strength of the big powers in the east through war. The Qin army had annihilated more than 1,600,000 men from the six states. By 230 BC, there was no challenge to the Qin army. So the Qin emperor, Ying Zheng, launched a large-scale war against the other states. During ten years of this war, the casualties of the armies of the six states amounted to more than two million, an astonishing number. In 221 BC, the Qi state surrendered without a fight. The Qin army pressed onwards to take Linzi, at that time the biggest city in the world. That put an end to the Warring States period and the Qin Empire came into being. From the rising in the Northwest Highlands until the unification of China, this great army had experienced more than 550 years of war. Xianyang Palace, once the heart of the Qin Empire, is near the city of Xianyang in Shanxi province today. It was right here in Xianyang that Emperor Ying Zheng issued orders and commanded his army to unify the country. 2,000 years has passed and Xianyang Palace is now little more than a heap of earth. No signs of the Qin army can be found. So what kind of army was this? The great historian Su Ma Qian was born 100 years after the Qin Empire. His renowned classical works, the historical records, record the wars waged one after another by the Qin army during those hundreds of years. But Su Ma Qian mentions little of the mechanisms and details of these wars. Only a few dozen words, sometimes much less, are written about a war of several months duration involving hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Sima Qian paid no attention to the weapons, equipment or tactics used by the Qin army. In 260 BC, the Qin army engaged in a decisive battle at Changping against the Zhao state, Qin's strongest opponent. The battle lasted two whole years. Sima Qian records that an ingenious detachment of 25,000 men of the Qin army set out to cut the Zhao army into two parts at a point when both sides were at a stalemate. But again, Sima Qin doesn't go into detail as to how this detachment won the battle with a surprise attack. Once the Zhao army was divided, the Qin army dispatched 5,000 cavalrymen to cut off the Zhao supply line. So what kind of troops were the Qin cavalry? The Qin army then immediately dispatched light troops to attack the Zhao army. These light troops must have had extraordinary attacking ability. So what exactly is the meaning of the word light?
Gaoping County in Shanxi Province was the site of the battle between the Qin and the Zhao at that time. With the passage of time, a village has emerged on that ancient battlefield. The head of the county museum regularly comes to the village to collect cultural relics, as the villagers often come across ancient weapons such as arrowheads. These arrowheads are deeply buried in the earth, and it seems sometimes even smell of blood. The Changping battle between the Qin and the Zhao was the crucial confrontation in the course of the unification of China by the Qin army. Hence, studying this military operation could be a good way to understand the Qin army. According to Sima Qin's records, a Qin army of about 600,000 took part in the battle right in this valley. Changping was nearly 500 kilometers from Xianyang, the capital of the Qin Empire. This means that more than 2,000 years ago, an army of 600,000 men, far from their own land, was engaged in a war for two years. Today's military experts are puzzled by this problem. Under the conditions existing then, it should have been absolutely impossible for the Qin army to fulfill such a task. In the winter of 1948, the Huaihai campaign broke out. This was the biggest campaign during the War of Liberation. Over the wide field of operations, the Liberation Army was closely followed by numerous peasant transport teams. They uninterruptedly transported grain and munitions to the front using their own carts and oxen. In the course of the whole operation, the Liberation Army had 600,000 soldiers on the battlefield, the same number as made up the Qin Army in the Changping operation. But there were 5,430,000 peasants supplying 600,000 soldiers of the Liberation Army. On average, it took nine peasants to supply one soldier. More than 2,000 years ago, the total population of the Qin Empire was no more than 5 million. How then was it possible for the Qin army to ensure supplies to those 600,000 men? How could the Qin Empire supply provisions to an army of five or 600,000 men to support wars which lasted for years on end? And at the beginning of the times of iron-made farm tools and draft animals, the consumption of military provisions would have been astonishing for this enormous army. How was the national strength of the Qin Empire able to support this huge drain? To these questions, Sima Qian doesn't give an answer in his historical records. However, he does record the more grisly details of the Qin army. The Zhao army was defeated and surrendered at Changping. After the surrender, 400,000 Zhao prisoners of war were buried alive. Only 240 very young men were released. 450,000 Zhao men were killed during the whole Changping operation. In the valley at Gaoping County in Shanxi province, archaeologists have made grim discoveries. Within a circumference of about 10 kilometers, big pits of buried skeletons can be found everywhere. More than a hundred corpses of Zhao soldiers can be found in just one pit. According to Sima Qian's writings, the Qin army was the embodiment of cruelty. At that time, an advisor wrote a description of the Qin army on the battlefield in another historical document, Essay on the Warring States. They carried prisoners of war in their arms and wore prisoners' heads hanging from their belts as they pursued and attacked.